Like you said, I'm glad you guys stuck it out for the end of the day. Um, what I want to talk about today is the it definitely falls in the bucket of Internet of Things, and I want to sort of demystify what that means uh, based on some of my experience working in the field. And so I want to particularly talk about sensors, um, how they play a role in this whole Internet of Things concept, and I want to really decompose it down to what does it mean, how can it actually change your business, and what, what have been my experience working with them for uh, the last 10 years. So um, here I put at scale in parentheses, that should be implicit. The things we're doing, the, the reason why Internet of Things is even a buzzword is because we're doing things at unprecedented scale. I'll again talk about what that actually means. And so there's devices generating data, it goes somewhere, and then you build apps, websites, APIs, services on top of it. I want to spend a lot of time talking about this amorphous cloudy thing over there. Um, and so what I want to do is, is say, you start with a device, some piece of hardware, maybe it's a temperature sensor, maybe it's a nest on your wall, uh, maybe it's something in your car. Um, you have to connect it somehow. Are we doing cell, satellite, Wi-Fi, direct connect, other means? Um, there's different protocols that are emerging also to make use of this. Things like MQTT, CoAP, XMPP. You notice I'm using lots of acronyms. It's confusing. And we're only just talking about devices right now. You haven't even done anything with the data yet, right? And so um, these are the three buckets I see. And the thing about this that uh, most people get hung up on is, as say you're a CIO and you're looking to, to, to do something in IoT, uh, you have to think about all this. It's complicated, it's confusing. And, and what I wanted to do today is spend, spend most of my time in the middle talking about what is that, that cloud I showed on the last slide? What are the things you actually practically need to care about? Um, but then on the other side, you have to make visualizations, you need to make mobile apps, you actually make sense of the data. So there's this whole journey that you have to go on um, and I think this is why a lot of people are, their companies are thinking, how do, I, how do I make sense of IoT or what do I want to do in it? It's because there's a lot going on. So um, quickly, a picture of myself uh, and my two co-founders. Why are we doing this and why should I have any sort of uh, experience to talk about it? Um, I've been doing this for, like I said, the last 10 years. First at Motorola, then I was working um, up in uh, Evanston at a geothermal startup. Um, and in that geothermal company, we were essentially doing a lots of early IoT work, right? We had to prove that geothermal worked. It sounds cool, right? Geothermal energy, it's renewable, it's alternative. Does it work? Can we show it to our customers? And so what we were telling our customers before was, you know, look at your bill in January 2013, look at it again in January 2014, and then you know that geo is working for you. So we're telling our customers, hey, wait about a year. The feedback loop to see if your investment is worthwhile is a year long. And so when I joined the company, I said, why don't we make that feedback loop a second long or a minute long? And that's, that's the path we went down, is, is, is thinking about that. So what I did is, is just measured everything. We deployed temperature sensors, pressure sensors, humidity, uh, smart meters, all sorts of gauges. And I didn't know any better. I said, let's just all put it all online right away. Let's send it back online. Um, and it was incredible. It was a huge breakthrough for our, for our company, right? Uh, we were able to, to show in a sales meeting, our sales guy whip out his phone and say, you know, this building just saved this many kilowatt hours in the last 10 minutes, right? So it was huge. It's all about accountability. We're deploying sensors, capturing data, and it transformed our business, right? Um, it was really cool. So with that background, I said, I bet other companies out there probably want the same thing. And this is before Internet of Things had even come out as a buzzword. Um, but that's, that's how we came to work in this field. And so a lot of my experience is rooted in that sort of accountability through data. And I'll talk about that a bit more. So first, I talked about we're deploying these devices and these sensors. What does it actually look like? And so this might be uh, slightly technical, but I think it's important to demystify what this actually all means. So your devices have some interesting properties. They might be mobile, they might be immobile, or they might be both. So let's say the, the example with the thermostat again, right? There's probably some properties. It's on building, it's on floor seven in this building. Um, that's important to, to define that up front because you might want to ask a question, what's the average temperature uh, on this floor right now? You need to go out to all your devices on this floor, figure out what's going on. So for a device that has a static location, there's a number of things you might want to track. Some of your devices are mobile. Let's say you're, you're monitoring a fleet of trucks, right? You, they're fundamentally moving over time. So you might want to ask a question, how many miles total did my trucks drive in the state of Indiana today, right? These are real things that people actually want to know. And so you have to know that your devices and sensors might also be moving. Um, there's other annotations that you also want to capture with your devices, such as, you know, Joe switched out the fan on pump number three or, or, or in, uh, in this, this device last week. There's all these uh, additional metadata you want to capture, so that's just on the device. We're not even talking about the discrete sensors on the device, it's just on the device. These are things you want to keep track of. 
Um, then the device has sensors. It could be measuring current, voltage, things like that. Um, it could, you could then want to, from those individual uh, sensors, have some computed or virtual things, right? You might want to p multiply that current times that voltage to get a, der a derivative power out the other side. Um, or you might want to deploy a power meter altogether, but that's up to you. These sensors, there's also stuff you want to track, such as, is it a Celsius? Is, is this sensor in Kelvin or Fahrenheit? What are the units that's attached to this sensor? So there's all sorts of things that, before we're even tracking any data, you have to sort of model uh, what's actually going on. And this stuff's important because it allows you to ask different kind of questions later. Um, you could imagine if half your temperature sensors are in Celsius and half are in Fahrenheit, you'll need to do some conversion before you do it, make any sense of them. So what does the actual data look like? We have an idea for these devices we're deploying, some of the, the information we want to track on them, but what does the actual data look like? And it's much simpler than you might imagine. Um, it looks sort of like this, right? It's a timestamp. Um, there's a number of ways you can capture the data. Um, for the more technical folks, always capture it in UTC. That might just be a side note, but um, time zones end, end up being your enemy when you're working with anything with, with, uh, with captured data because uh, there's after I've got into this for a while, there's 15 minute time zones in India. Um, there's some people that do daylight saving time, some that don't. Um, there's a canonical way to capture it and it's called UTC and I would advise all of you to capture your data that way. Um, there's different things you're capturing. Sure, we, I talked about the idea of a temperature sensor a few times and that's just a value. You might be capturing time. Let's say you're measuring the latency uh, of something in your network, right? You don't want to capture time. You might be capturing a count. How many times the switch was flipped on and off? Um, which, which is the last example there. So it's not just measuring uh, different sensors, there's different counts, there's times, there's different things you want to be able to, uh, to keep track of. So again, what else, um, as, you're, as you're capturing this data, what else, what other context? Um, if, if you get into manufacturing context, there's this idea of quality. I think I measured a good value, but I wasn't sure. So you want to capture that as well. Is this good, bad, unknown? Um, it's important to capture everything in UTC, but you might want to capture the additional metadata. I was in Indiana when this was captured, right? Um, these are the things that you want to think about in addition. And this is only talking about the, the actual sensor data. This is on top of all the stuff I talked about for the device data previously. So if you put it all together, you have this timestamp, you have some sort of value, and this additional metadata. And this is probably on the bottom line what it looks like in, in your storage system. Um, and that might be a little bit too esoteric, but this is what I'm just trying to demystify what this whole Internet of Things, Internet of Things thing is about. So this is where I started, right? Where essentially I've described things. You have some hardware out in the real world. You're trying to map it online. You're trying to keep track of all these things such as this is a thermostat on this floor in this building and I'm capturing a temperature in Celsius and here's the values I'm storing over time. You're sort of moving from left to right now. And what I find that's really interesting and I like to call this my consultant slide because I feel like if I worked at a, a, like McKinsey, I would, I would produce this, but I really think this is true. Um, and this is just distilled from me working with people trying to do stuff with sensors and devices for the last 10 years. It's that the first problem you have is I want to deploy a million different sensors out in the world. How the heck do I actually get the information off of them? Am I polling them every minute? Are they pushing stuff to me every second? Does it go through a gateway? Which protocols am I using? And this is before we even have the data. These are the things you're thinking about just at the base level here. But let's say you figure that out. You now have the ability to store all this information in one place. So you probably feel really good. I deployed a million things out in the world, and now I can go look at anything at any time. But you can't make a dashboard with a million things on it, right? It's just, it's just it's not uh, something that's possible. So you need a system that's smart enough to tell you what to look at. Maybe you want to know when the temperature goes, is the, maybe the temperature goes two standard deviations away from the 30-day moving average, right? You're, you're trying to track trends over time. You want the system to tell you when something happens because you can't go be looking at everything at all the time. But let's say the system is smart enough to actually tell you when something happens. Then you want to ask deep questions. How many times before has this happened? What are the correlating factors? What was the state of the world? Just show me everything for the last hour, right? You sort of get into this forensic analysis mode. You're moving up the stack here, right? And let's say you, you, you figure it out. You say, I think I know why this happened. Then you want to ask the system, tell me before that happens again. Can you predict before that happens again? Because I, I, don't, I don't want to be reacting. I want to be, be predictive here. But at the end of the day, the whole point of, of deploying these sensors, collecting this data is, how can you actually change your business? What would you do differently if you had this information? Um, and it's usually pretty simple. Usually there's it's human factors. Um, let's say that you're a uh, utility and you've deployed all these smart meters measuring all the real-time energy use in your homes, right? You probably want to say, do I need to send a truck, a, a, a team of people out there to look at this? Or uh, is this okay? Is this a blip? Has this happened in the past? Is this a, something that's recurring or is this a one-time thing, right? The reason to do all this stuff is to inform those decisions, right? Um, and some people miss that. And I think you could even put a little 
small hat on top of this and say control, right? You can imagine a future when instead of informing decisions of should I roll a truck or not, you take automated actions on, on the system's behalf. So I know this, I said this is my consultant slide, but I believe it. I mean, I see people go through this all the time. And usually when I meet people, they're in the first one, maybe the second step. And so my job is to try to help them go up the stack. So um, we spent a little bit of time on this. And what I'm gonna do now for the, for the rest of the talk is just sort of work through each of these levels and sort of, again, decompose what's actually in here. What do you actually have to do to, to, to make sense of this? So first is, if you're going to be capturing the data, you have to be modeling in the ways that I talked about before, right? Your devices have this metadata, floor seven, building X. Um, your devices have sensors. If it's, a, if it's like the Nest thermostat, there's actually temperature, there's pressure, um, there is uh, light, there's sound, there's motion, there's all these different sensors. So you have this, this slight hierarchy of a device has n number of sensors, and those sensors again have metadata such as the degrees, is it in, is it in Celsius or Fahrenheit, what is, what is the, the unit? Um, that's all I really need to say about that one. So we, we've now started to capture the data, but there's different ways the data gets to you, right? Maybe the data is streaming it to you in real time. Every second you're being pushed information. And so you could imagine a million different things pushing you information at the same time. You're gonna have issues around concurrency. How do you actually hold, handle that amount of scale? But on the other end, maybe the data is just sent to you once a day. Maybe, you know, for like the, the smart meter example, um, they, they capture all the information and then they FTP you one giant file at the end of the day and say, I want this available in the next 30 minutes, right? So there's this idea of, of capturing the data, storing it, and then forwarding it to you later. Um, you have to deal with both those use cases and they're totally uh, orthogonal to each other, but that's, that's a part of, of the, the, the type of thing you have to deal with. I talked about some of the prevailing protocols earlier. Um, there's a whole bunch more, and I think these are some of the early ones, but uh, the point of bringing this up is to say, no one's got this figured out yet. There's different, there's different advantages to each of these different protocols. Um, the, one that, the one thing that no one has a good answer to is security yet, so I think that's something at least to be aware of when you're thinking about this for your projects. There's, there's, there's people who are, are saying they have it figured out, there's a lot more work to do. Um, one thing I think is different, if you think about some of your other IT projects, if you're gonna be deploying an Internet of Things project, is that usually, let's say that you're Netflix, right? You want to uh, distribute the, the TV shows and movies as close to your customers as possible, and then so they can download it locally. It's, it's called a, a content delivery network or a CDN, right? You're deploying content out so it can be downloaded really quickly. In, in this domain, in, in IoT, you actually want to capture things at the edges, right? Um, and so I call this idea of a reverse CDN. Um, there's different gateways that are usually placed at the edges or on in your installations that are uh, capturing data and forwarding it on. And so it's just a, it's a bit of a different problem than you might be used to. Um, another idea is that should you be sending everything up online? What can you compress either at the source? What can you just throw out? Um, this becomes really important if your devices are connected via cell. Um, if you look at what the carriers are charging per megabyte, sometimes per hundreds of kilobytes, it's still very, very expensive and cost prohibitive. So it's something to think about. Um, are you just blindly forwarding up all the information or are you, are you sort of filtering it before you send it over the wire? So we're, we're sort of moving up now. We, we talked about capturing, now we're talking about storing it. And so I want to talk about some of the, uh, some of the requirements about what type of data you have to store, right? Um, it's streams of, of time-based data, so there's a few properties. Usually it's sent to you in order. I'm, as, I'm, as I'm measuring, I'm sending it to you, so the data is written to you in order. That's kind of interesting. Um, you don't really ever edit it later. It's highly immutable data, so there's lots of advantage you can take, uh, it's lots of things you can take advantage of if you know that the data is rarely edited. And then you read it back in order. So if you think about this, it's written to you in order, you don't really change it that often, it's read back in order. You could actually store things in that way. Instead of indexing it on the timestamp, you could actually store things in order on disk. That might be an optimization you could make. Um, another one is that the data doesn't stop. You're fundamentally going to be uh, outgrowing a single server, so you better have a, a strategy for moving beyond a single server. It's, it, a technical term is called sharding for that. Um, but how are you going to do it? Are you going to split up half of your customers over here and half over there? Are you going to split by time, put all your customers on one box? Um, another interesting thing about the data is that it doesn't stop, right? You're always fundamentally going to be having more data, and then if you add more sensors, then the, the slope of your, your, your growth curve actually bends up. And so, you have, you have to be thinking about this stuff ahead of time. Um, 
Another thing is this idea I talked earlier about only sending up what matters. You could compress at the edges. Um, you could also compress uh, once you get the, the data into your system. So if you think about uh, a lot of this data, it's all time-based. It's called time series data. Um, but you think about it as sort of electrical engineer and, and think of this like as a DSP problem, you could actually com try to compress the signal and keep the interesting characteristics as opposed to just uh, after a week, we'll keep the hourly averages, right? There's different approaches you can take. But if you know these, that your data has these characteristics, you can sort of think about this ahead of time. So we're moving up the stack. Um, we're up to the monitoring uh, uh, section now. So when you think about monitoring, the one that always people think about is just a basic threshold. Let me know when X goes above Y, when the temperature is above 75 degrees, very much in the vein of if this, then that. Um, so I think that's a good place to start. But if you're storing all this information, could you use that to look back historically and inform where should, should that threshold be static or could you have it be dynamic? Could you, be, could you be comparing the current value to the moving average, right? And so this idea of, of having more than just a static threshold, could the system figure out an anomaly for you if you don't even know what an anomaly is, right? I think these are the kind of things that, that when I see customers thinking about their data and especially the monitoring this way um, is really interesting. Another one is the, the omission of data. If you don't have new information, that's also a form of information saying, is the device offline? Do I need to figure this out? Did I lose my connection? That's something you need to really think about. Um, another one is, is this idea of continuous query. So I talked about earlier, you might want to, if you're measuring a current and you're measuring a voltage, you might want to multiply those together to get a power. You could also derive that on the fly as the data is streaming in and, and continues to be computing this power and sending it out. So there's all sorts of really cool things you could do if you're fundamentally dealing with these, with these streams of data. So um, I talked about some of the, the things you do with monitoring. Um, and some of the examples I said earlier, you know, let me know if the current value is 40% higher than the 12 hour moving average and it's in that condition for 15 minutes, right? There's really cool things you can do if you, if you have all the historical data and you're using it to inform your, your current rules. Um, an important thing here is some people think, you know, just let me know when something happens, but it's also important to keep track of when something goes away, right? So it's sort of rising edge, falling edge. When you get into a condition and then when you go out of a condition, you probably want to do both. Um, and the other thing is you might think, oh great, just send me a text when this happens. Um, but what I found is that again and again, it's, it's usually send a text to this guy, send an email to this person, phone this one. There's multiple consumers of this information. Um, we're out of time? Are we good? Okay, all right. So I think if we think about this idea, uh, I, I appear on the screen, it says streaming analytics. And that's, I know that's an overloaded uh, word, but uh, I'll talk about what, what that means is that usually you want to ask a question, you want to say, uh, I'm measuring the temperature every second, and I want to look back at the last year and say, give me the hourly average for the whole last year. It's going to be too big to fit in memory, so you know you're going to have to be streaming over data. Um, how would you do that? Um, and could you actually make those, those, those sort of roll-ups be first-class citizens of your system? Um, that's, that's an approach that I see a lot of people uh, do very well with. The alternative is, I'll just pre-compute all this stuff, right? If I know that my customer wants to know the daily average, I'll just you know, pre-compute that ahead of time, but if they want to ask me for the hourly average, I just don't have it, right? Um, these are characteristics of the data that you have to really think about ahead of time. Another one is, is interpolation. This is one I, I see a lot of people need to use is that uh, you expect to have this data streaming in all the time and usually you might have an outage. You're missing, you thought it was going to be in every second, you have about every 10 seconds, you're missing a whole day's worth. Uh, the system has to look historically and try to uh, fill in the gaps for you. I think it's been something that that's people have had a lot of success with. Okay, so if you put it all together in a picture, it might look something like this. Uh, we're capturing the data, we're monitoring as it comes in, we're doing this analytics. I talked a lot at the outset about how would you model your data, what sort of context, and why that's important, because you want to ask a question like, what's the average temperature on floor seven? Or let me know when any thermostat on floor seven goes above the average of all the devices. The context kind of cuts across. And so this is, if I had to put everything I was talking about into a picture, it'd probably look something like this. That's it. Good. Any questions? What, what do you think of cellular exclusively as a, as a form of communicating between the device and the cloud? So which type of cellular? It's SMS. So sending data over SMS yeah. as opposed to just using uh, a normal data connection? Or um, internet, Wi-Fi. Yeah, so I, I think SMS is interesting because it's sort of a, a fundamental hack on cell already, right? Um, I think it, it's, I haven't heard anyone do that before. It seems like it be cost prohibitive, um, especially the, a lot of the pricing I've seen around the new 4G networks 
they're designed to ship across a lot of data, less expensive. So I would be surprised if that, maybe it's an interesting hack, and I haven't just run the economics, but I'd be surprised if, if that could work at scale. It's a cool idea. Yeah. Good? Thanks. <laughs>